Good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to share some information on the Upper Great Lakes Management Unit Lake Huron Office Offshore and Nearshore Assessment Programs. Now these two programs are the primary means in which we are able to characterize the composition and distribution of offshore and nearshore fish communities in Ontario waters of Lake Huron. So by necessity, this presentation will be a upper level broad overview of some of the results from these surveys, uh, just based upon the time that's available. But hopefully you'll get a sense of some of the changes and in many cases dramatic changes that we've seen in the composition and the relative abundance of a variety of fish species in Ontario waters. So I'd like to just provide you with a brief outline of the presentation. I will highlight the purpose of the programs, their history, some of the methods that we use, and I uh, will also provide a selective summary of data. <coughs> and I'll start out with the Offshore Index Program. Uh, this program has been around for a uh, much longer time than the Nearshore Program. It's uh, primarily geared towards monitoring year class strength of a variety of species particularly lake whitefish, yellow perch, species that are important to the commercial fishery. Uh, we also uh, are able to determine pre-recruit indices, primarily for lake whitefish, uh, looking at growth and maturity. And these uh, surveys also serve as long-term community indices. So we were able to determine changes in uh, relative abundance over time. And we also get uh, an insight into species diversity in the lake as well. So this next slide just gives you an indication of the programs that have been conducted. And my focus in this talk will be the core areas that we have sampled. And you can see that uh, they date back to the late 1970s. So in uh, three or four locations in the lake, in Ontario waters, we have uh, quite a bit of trend through time information uh, that spans almost 40 years. We also have some complementary surveys that have been conducted over the years that we refer to as legacy uh, surveys. Some of these were uh, initiated uh, quite some time ago, back to the mid-1960s, and a lot of them were tar targeted for specific reasons. Uh, some of this work was conducted out of the South Bay Research Station that used to be present on Manitoulin Island. Uh, it no longer exists. But uh, it conducted a number of fish community surveys in the South Bay area of uh, the uh, Ontario waters of Lake Huron. And that was primarily geared towards determining the effectiveness of the splake and back cross stockings that occurred in the basin back in the uh, 60s and 70s. So that information is available and it complements some of the uh, core work that we have done. There was a brief time in which we conducted uh, trawling surveys for uh, juvenile or young of the year lake whitefish and yellow perch. Uh, we don't uh, do that program any longer, but uh, uh, in recent years we've looked at the implementation of some hydroacoustic surveys. And we've also uh, conducted a number of targeted surveys. These are primarily geared towards specific locations and primarily towards uh, lake trout rehabilitation zones. So looking at the success of stocking of lake trout that has occurred in Ontario waters for a number of decades. So as I said, I'm going to focus on the core areas. And I'll just give you a brief overview of the survey design. Uh, this program consists of multi-mesh bottom set gill nets. Uh, these nets are set perpendicular to depth contours. Uh, they are comprised of fixed sites that are fished on an annual basis and they're supplemented by random locations as well. And the intent there is to try to uh, keep up with the changes in the ecology of the lake and uh, differences in fish behavior and distribution patterns. Um, the areas that are uh, focused in, in a particular location are focused around a core or a bio-egg and the locations, the netting locations, are situated within these uh, bio-eggs. The nets are depth stratified, so we're looking at a variety of depths in the offshore waters, and we record information such as latitude, longitude of the sets, sucky depth. Uh, we take account of weather, temperature, depth, and these nets are set 
uh, for 20 to 24 hours, so they're overnight net sets. So just to give you an overview of how that program has evolved over the years, you can see that uh, the history dates back to the late 1970s and the number of actual sites sampled has varied from two to about nine sets and on average we sample about five locations so those are the core areas. The number of uh, nets set that from our core locations has uh, progressively increased so uh, we haven't had a decline in the number of sets uh, in these core areas and you can see that there's more variability in total sets that represent some of the supplemental or complementary surveys that were conducted over the years as well. So it's a program that has maintained itself and like I said it's the primary means of establishing the characteristics of the offshore fish community. Just to give you an idea of the, of the spatial coverage that uh, these programs represent, this is an example of our 2014 sampling locations and these are the core areas, Grand Bend, Southampton, Cape Rich, and Georgian Bay. Uh, more intermittently, uh, we've sampled the Collingwood uh, area and Clapperton Island, which is our primary index location for the North Channel. So this is typically our coverage. Um, it looks more impressive than it actually is. Th those dots are rather large, representing a net site. When you're actually out on the water, it's, it's quite... Um, it's a different story. It's, it's very humbling when you realize how large a body of water we're working on. Uh, just highlighting some of the locations that we don't sample. So there's a lot of areas in the basin, not only the main basin but Georgian Bay, that we don't have trend through time information. And uh, that uh, makes it a little more difficult in terms of interpreting what's happening with the offshore fish community. So I just wanted to point that out. We also are challenged by the, just the sheer size of the area that we're working in. Of course, on the main basin, we're working on the eastern coast of the main basin, so we have a very large fetch to deal with, and weather conditions can be quite challenging in the spring and even in the summer. So this just gives you an idea of the variability in the start and end dates from our south uh, main basin uh, survey areas. So there's a fair bit of variation in uh, the duration of these surveys uh, and that's basically a reflection of weather conditions uh, just the challenges of going out there and actually getting able to, uh, being able to get to your uh, uh, appropriate sampling locations. So there are variable starts and durations and that's mostly weather related. Now I'm going to present you with a, a broad overview of what we've observed in terms of the relative abundance of a variety of species in the fish community in offshore waters. And this is an amalgamation of all the offshore, site, offshore sites that we have conducted over the years. And basically what you see is that there's been a dramatic decline in the abundance of a variety of species in the offshore waters of uh, the Ontario waters of Lake Huron. And I just wanted to point out this database goes from the 1979 period to 2014. The onset of zebra mussels is indicated here and coaga mussels in the early 2000s. We also, as would have it, we uh, shifted gear arrangements in the uh, early 1990s. We switched from multifilament braided mesh gill nets to monofilament. Of course, that happened at a time when things really changed in the offshore fish community. So we do have some calibration that was done to determine the difference between the multi and the monofilament nets, but you can see that there's been a precipitous decline in the abundance of fish, uh, relative abundance of a number of fish species since the mid-1990s. And over the past decade, we've seen very low abundance of a variety of fish species. And much of this change has been driven by the variable abundance of yellow perch, bloater chub, whitefish, alewife, and smelt. Those are the primary species that drive this uh, trend in uh, declining abundance. Now, these offshore index surveys are targeting specific species, and I'm going to highlight those species in this next slide. Uh, they're aimed at trying to determine the dynamics of lake whitefish, yellow perch, deepwater chub, 
and lake trout. And when we just focus on those species, you can see that there's been a dramatic decline in the abundance of lake whitefish, yellow perch, and deep water chub that were much more abundant in the mid uh, 1980s. And just to give you further insights into the dynamics of individual species and how they've changed over time, I'm just going to focus on specific species in this slide. So lake trout, in the early years, uh, we had established very high abundances of splake and backcross lake trout. And that's evident in the early 1980s, mid-1980s. We switched to pure strain lake trout. We were able to build up abundances of uh, the pure strain lake trout form, but you can see that there's been a progressive decline since the early 1990s to the current years. We've also seen a dramatic decline in the relative abundance of lake whitefish from 1980 to 2015. And what you'll see is a, a recurring theme here that uh, we've seen a decline in the abundance of other species, such as alewife. We've uh, seen the collapse of alewife that was observed throughout uh, the main basin of Lake Huron in 2003. Uh, it was evident in our offshore program. You can see the decline here. Uh, Deepwater chub as well in decline. Cisco species, uh, uh, or at least uh, artidae, uh, more variable, but uh, we've also seen some declines and uh, a bit of a, an increase in recent years. Rainbow smelt, the other primary prey species, has also declined substantially. Let's continue on. Uh, white sucker, long nose sucker, round white fish, yellow perch, and to a lesser extent walleye have all declined in abundance. I'm going to focus on the different basins. So this slide highlights uh, the results of our survey in the main basin of Ontario waters. And you can see it's a, the consistent trend is uh, uh, persisted here, where you see a dramatic decline in the abundance, relative abundance of the fish community from the mid-1990s to the current years. And again, driven by uh, declines in yellow perch, bloater chub, whitefish, alewife, and smelt. And if we look at the target species, again, you can see that it's driven by uh, declines in yellow perch, bloater chub, and whitefish. And if we go to the Cape Rich Index, which is in Georgian Bay, you can see that we still have that decline, and it's even more dramatic in recent years. Uh, there's been quite a substantial decline in the relative abundance of a variety of species. And again, in, the, in this area, it's white sucker, smelt, alewife, and splake that are the primary species that are driving this decline. And when you look at the target species from this survey in Georgia Bay, it's being driven by the decline of splake, primarily because we switched over to uh, pure strain lake trout. Lake whitefish have declined substantially in recent years, as well as lake trout. You can see that over the past decade, the catch rates for a variety of species in Georgian Bay from this uh, particular location have declined dramatically. So with that, I'm going to go inshore to the shallower waters and discuss our nearshore index. Now this program doesn't have as long a history as the offshore program. It uh, dates back to about the mid-1990s. It started out as a, an experimental program, uh, trying to use a variety of methodologies to uh, quantify the nearshore fish community. Uh, it evolved into a strategic program and currently operates as an opportunistic program due to funding constraints. So I'll elaborate on that a little further. So the nearshore index is primarily to monitor spawner abundance uh, for species such as walleye muscalunge. Uh, it provides a nearshore community index. We have one location in which we have trend through time information. This is just an indication of the type of surveys that we have conducted um, with this program. Uh, it's primarily live capture gear that we use, uh, trap nets. Uh, the spring walleye index netting is uh, targeting spawning walleye runs. The spring musky index is targeting spawning aggregations of muscalunge. The nearshore community index netting is to get a broad perspective of the nearshore fish community. 
That's uh, been evolved into an end of spring trap netting where uh, our catch rates for a variety of species are enhanced in the spring because of uh, increase in movement patterns. And we also have a small fish index netting program which targets juveniles and smaller components of the fish community. We have a fall walleye index netting program which is a provincially standardized uh, program primarily targeting uh, walleye during the fall aggregations, but it also gets a, a, also targets a other variety of species. And we collect information such as uh, location of our sets, weather, temperature, substrate composition, cover, and these are, again, overnight sets. So I'll start with the tributary assessments. They're primarily geared towards monitoring the abundance of walleye populations in the Ontario waters of uh, Lake Huron. And this is just a map uh, showing the historical locations of walleye populations throughout the basin. In our waters, walleye are typically associated with tributary habitats that provide the spawning areas that are necessary to maintain their populations. And you can see that there are a variety of populations distributed throughout that east coast of Georgian Bay and into the North Channel. In some locations, we have data that dates back to the 1960s I'm per primarily referring to the spring walleye index netting surveys. And this is just a, a typical example of a population in the Moon River, uh, historically renowned for producing very large walleye. And uh, basically some of these uh, results that we've obtained indicate that there's been a precipitous decline in the abundance of many of our walleye stocks. Uh, you can see that uh, these surveys that date back to the late 1960s uh, indicate a progressive decline in the abundance of adult walleye in the spawning runs. And in a lot of cases, uh, that can be associated with uh, issues related to habitat, but in many cases, it's probably associated with overexploitation of the current walleye stocks. This is an example of uh, results from our FWIN surveys and our end of spring trap netting surveys from a, a couple of, actually from three locations in the basin, from Severn Sound, Moon River, and the French River, Again, when we compare these results to benchmarks established uh, with this methodology in other parts of the province, we can see that consistently we are seeing low relative abundance of walleye populations throughout Ontario waters of Lake Huron. I'm going to quickly shift to coastal wetlands. Um, some of the recent uh, wetland work that's been done uh, in the basin suggests that in Georgian Bay and the North Channel we have some of the highest quality wetlands throughout the Great Lakes. And these wetland uh, habitats are important for a variety of species, especially those species that are obligate wetland spawners such as northern pike and muscalunge. So I'm just going to quickly highlight some of the results from our surveys uh, related to this particular habitat type. I mentioned that we have one location in which we have long-term data, uh, a data series, and that's in Severn Sound, which is located in southern Georgian Bay. And here's an example where we see a species such as northern pike and the influence of low lake levels and what that's meant in terms of northern pike recruitment. Uh, this graph shows that we have data dating back to the early 1980s. And throughout uh, a high water cycle in Lake Huron, we had very high recruitment of northern pike. And when we saw the precipitous decline in lake levels in 1999, we saw a concurrent decline in the relative abundance of northern pike. So this basically suggested that northern pike weren't able to access uh, traditional spawning habitats, uh, many of which were high and dry during this uh, low water cycle. Um, we also monitor muscalunge that are present throughout eastern Georgian Bay in the North Channel and we have conducted uh, surveys, spawning surveys in the spring for this particular species. This is just an example of catch rates that we obtain from a variety of locations. There's quite a bit of variability and unfortunately we haven't had uh, enough spatial coverage and temporal coverage to really get a good sense of the dynamics of these populations over time. In some locations in which we've had multiple surveys, there really isn't any clear indication that this particular species has declined in abundance since the mid-1990s. I'm going to move on to shorelines. And uh, these areas uh, are occupied by a diverse fish community. 
And I'm going to highlight one of the species that seems to have benefited from a general warming trend in the nearshore waters, and that is the smallmouth bass. We uh, monitor the species and have been for quite some time since the mid-1990s. Uh, our early program consisted of nearshore community index netting, which uh, is using trap nets, and this netting is usually conducted in the late summer, early fall. And some of that early work uh, revealed to us that uh, bass respond on a regional basis in terms of year class strength. Some of you in the crowd may have remembered the 1992 cataclysmic Mount Pinatubo eruption. I certainly remember that event. <laughs> Anyways, um, we were able to discern a uh, major impact on year class production for smallmouth bass from that event. This is the results from some of our nearshore community index netting surveys from the uh, mid-1990s, uh, from 1996 through 1998, in a variety of locations. And you could see that that year class that would have been produced in 1992 was very low consistently across a fairly large geographic range. So it provided us with insights that smallmouth bass recruitment occurs on a regional basis, and that cold weather events have a major impact on recruitment for this particular species. I mentioned Severn Sound. We have monitored this uh, area for a number of decades, and you can see from the relative abundance of smallmouth bass using our end of spring trap netting methodology that the relative abundance of smallmouth bass has remained consistently high in this location, and it also has been consistently high in a number of other locations that we monitor using the same methodology. So smallmouth bass are producing consistently strong year classes in the, in the last decade, and they probably benefited from the continued expansion of round goby. Round goby are a primary diet item right now. They're found in high abundance, and we are seeing incredible growth rates of smallmouth bass in the past decade. And uh, not only the size of the fish, but the number of fish that are reach reaching very large sizes. I'm going to briefly mention the Severn Sound area again. I'm going to look at the near shore fish community and looking at uh, a subjective categor categorization of feeding guilds. So we're looking at predators, panfish, and benthic fish over a fairly lengthy time frame from the mid 1970s to currently. And basically, what I wanted to show here is that the near shore fish community in any particular location can change dramatically over time. And what we've seen is the differential composition of uh, uh, predators in this particular location. We've seen an expansion of smallmouth bass and largemouth bass. They now comprise a major component of the predator uh, component of this fish community. And we've seen major declines in panfish populations. This was primarily driven by the decline in black crappie populations in Severn Sound. And we've seen a consistent representation of benthic fish in many waters of eastern Georgian Bay and the North Channel, uh, bullhead, brown bullhead are the dominant species in these near, near shore areas. So there's, a vari there's variability in near shore fish community composition over time. And this next slide highlights there's incredible variation in composition. This is just an example of the same breakdown in the near shore fish community in four different locations throughout eastern Georgian Bay. And you can see the dramatic differences in species composition depending on where you are. So it's very difficult to discern the dynamics of nearshore fish communities, uh, not only within a location, but over time, because they're very distinct depending on what part of the uh, lake you're looking at. There's also a productivity gradient from southern Georgia Bay to northern Georgia Bay and into the North Channel. So this just presents challenges in trying to uh, determine the dynamics in the near shore fish communities. I mentioned we also conduct a small fish community survey. The intent of uh, this assessment is to look primarily at uh, near shore areas and nursery and feeding grounds and looking at uh, shifts in community structure, track exotic species, primarily species like the round goby that uh, we don't track through our trap netting program. So this program was initiated in 2003 
doesn't have as long a time frame as some of the other programs. You can see the distribution of effort. Uh, these spatial areas are quite small, but they're distributed throughout the uh, Ontario waters of Lake Huron, primarily to gauge the expanded distribution of species like uh, the round goby. So I'm just going to highlight some of the results and also um, emphasize the extreme variability that we see uh, from these surveys. This is just an example of results from 2014, highlighting some sampling areas in the, the main basin and uh, southern Manitoulin Island. And you can see that the catches are dominated by minnow species. And in some locations, we actually have pockets of high alewife abundance in near shore areas. So in the near shore, we likely have refuge areas for um, alewife populations. And you can also see that there's different differential representation of different uh, fish families within the sampling locations. And I'll, I'll just show you that the North Channel is very distinct from the main basin. Again here, dominated by cyprinids and also persids. Whereas in Georgian Bay, you get another entirely different picture where you have representation from uh, centrarchids, cyprinids, persids, and in some cases, we have high abundance of round goby. Uh, round goby is a species that's really difficult to monitor with this type of program because you're looking at very limited spatial coverage. And we see dramatic shifts in abundance of this species uh, in any given year. Uh, in 2014, uh, round goby dominated the species composition in Owen Sound, which is a, a fairly perturbed location. Uh, industrial shorelines, uh, not a lot of uh, nearshore predator species. So you see a, a large increase in the abundance of round goby. Whereas in some of these other locations, round goby abundance seems to have declined. And there are also some locations in which we have never seen round goby currently in those locations. So just to summarize, the Offshore Index Program has monitored fish community changes since the late 1970s. Its spatial coverage has been limited, but we've been able to mount a consistent program over the years. There have been declines in relative abundance by a number of species since the early 1990s. The relative abundance of the offshore fish community is currently at the lowest level in the time series. The nearshore program has been in place since the mid-1990s. Spatial coverage and continuity is limited except for Severn Sound. And discerning nearshore fish community trends is a challenge due to the inherent variability in fish community composition and distribution. And my final bullet is much more work needs to be done. Thank you for